Welcome, and thank you for joining the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFES, in this discussion series about democratic resilience in Europe. IFES assists democratic processes and electoral systems very broadly defined across the world. And we have worked with elections in European countries since the fall of the Iron Curtain. This is the 26th installment in our discussion series. We have so far covered issues from election administration to cybersecurity, to uh, disinformation targeting women in politics, abuse of state resources, and the role of the Russian government in influencing elections and democracy in European countries. If you've missed any of our previous discussions, you can find recordings of them on our YouTube channel. My colleague is putting a link to that in the chat right now. I'm Magnus Sermon. I'm the IFAS Senior Political Finance Advisor, and I'm also Director of the IFAS Regional Europe Office in the Czech Republic, and we are hosting this discussion. This event is part of a larger USAID-funded program of democracy assistance with the goal of supporting leadership that champions democratic practices and is made possible through the generous assistance of the American people. The way that Europeans consume information has changed profoundly in recent years. Social media has revolutionized the sharing of information and brought in an entirely new set of actors to the public arena. Influencers have become a key source of both information and inspiration on different topics from cooking to yoga to computing, fashion and health advice. The great power and credibility that influencers hold among the often millions of followers also provides opportunities to counteract the greatest threats to democracy, like disinformation, like foreign interference and digital authoritarianism. These are threats not only against democracy, but against many aspects of our lives. Threats often made worse by social media. So today we want to discuss how should we perceive the role of influencers at a time when repressive regimes are expanding their propaganda strategies? Can and, and should influencers serve as a tool for good in democratic resilience in Europe? With us to discuss these uh, issues, we have Associate Professor Dr. Denisa Halova, strategic, strategic communications expert at Charles University here in the Czech Republic. We have Viktor Berezenko, uh, founder of the Institute of Cognitive Modeling in Ukraine. We have Ina Miroshnichenko, influencer, blogger, and TV uh, television host, also in Ukraine, and Daria Asariev North program manager, Europe and Eurasia at IFAS. She's based in the United States. After talking to our panelists, we will open for questions and for a discussion. If you have any questions, you can already now type those in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So let me first turn to Daria Asrgivnov, program manager at IFAS. Um, Daria, please um, help us understand the context here. What could be the role of influencers in democratic resilience, if anything? Thank you. And uh, first of all, hello to everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this interesting discussion. Uh, as you mentioned, Magnus, uh, the spread of social media has ushered in an era with a new set of actors that can profoundly impact the information environment. Uh, many influencers have now gained a voice that spans across socioeconomic and political divides and even national borders. Uh, so content creators and influencers have now become opinion makers, often with a great level of credibility uh, among their followers. As people are increasingly turning to social media as their main source of information and news, uh, especially young people, uh, influencers potentially have an important role to play in what information they choose to share and how uh, because of their ability to influence hundreds of thousands or millions of people at a time. 
social media has uh, become center stage for advancing key political or national security objectives in many ways. So while the concept of influence as a political tool uh, certainly isn't new, uh, its role will continue to evolve in the digital age and impact democratic processes. And we're really seeing uh, authoritarian regimes and malign actors uh, being very cognizant of this. So they're continuously seeking to leverage this uh, to their advantage through tools such as disinformation, uh, which uh, continues to be one of the greatest threats to democratic resilience. Some good examples of this that we've seen are uh, in Belarus, uh, where the regime after the August 2020 presidential elections that were widely disputed and the consequent uh, protests, um, the regime moved from using traditional media, state TV channels to the online uh, and social media sphere. And similarly, the Kremlin has deployed a wide range of tools, uh, including influencers, to spread deliberate disinformation, uh, serving the regime's goals in parallel to the war in Ukraine. So uh, really, if we look at the unprecedented ability of influencers to reach people and harness a level of credibility that often surpasses uh, traditional media sources, uh, we should acknowledge that with this expansive power also comes great potential, uh, as well as great risk and responsibility. Thank you very much, Daria. Uh, my next question goes to Ina Miloshnichenko, influencer, blogger, and television host in Ukraine. Ina, <clears throat> do you consider that as a social media influencer, you have a role to play in politics? Uh, first of all, hi to everyone. I thank you for having me here. And uh, of course, I will be speaking about situation in Ukraine. It's not the same as all over the world. And if we are talking about Ukrainian bloggers, all of the bloggers before the school, uh, full scale war, uh, Russian uh, against Ukraine, bloggers were mostly out of politics. I'm talking now about uh, Instagram, TikTok bloggers, uh, or other entertainment social media where bloggers can gather uh, million of subscribers. But that February uh, changed everything. The war had come uh, to the home of every subscriber, of every blogger, and that's why they could not stand against the war, against the politic anymore. And uh, events, to, events developed so quickly and uh, people needed operational and urgent information. Uh, we used to get the information from uh, mass media, but mass media workers also needed time to recover, to save their lives, to save their children and so on. And if we are talking about mass media, mass media um, needs some censorship. And I'm talking not about that censorship that replaces concepts, but I'm talking about editorial process. Uh, Mass media workers need to understand circumstances, need to make text or make video to uh, edit it and so on and so on. It takes time. Uh, in the first weeks of war, everyone switched to personal blogs, even mass media workers. Uh, because uh, people didn't know whom to read, uh, where to took uh, operational information here and now. So the bloggers became uh, to their aid. And uh, bloggers reported the information second by second, what was happening. They became a place of informational exchange. Uh, they shared announcements about, for example, evacuation that was organized by uh, ordinary residents or about the food, water, medicine, and so on. Because in the first uh, uh, days and even months of war, nothing worked here. For example, in Kyiv, we have no place where to buy water, where to buy food, where to buy medicine and so on. So bloggers uh, said us the information where we may find it. Maybe someone had it in its own place. So that's why bloggers became side by side with uh, mass media and they started to engage in politics because they have their own opinion, they influence on people, on people's minds and thoughts. Uh, they broadcast their own vision, their own thoughts, 
and that's give the form of people's action. And uh, on my opinion, this is politics because this is the art of people management. Bloggers now manage all of the people in Ukraine because they give information which starts something, something thinking process in my mind. That's why blogger give me uh he influence on me. That's why the name of the position influencer, blogger influence on me and make my mind to do something or to choose someone. So I think that uh, if uh, bloggers will stay in these circumstances, in this politics, I think that a lot of bloggers will become traditional politics uh, politicians in one, two, or maybe five years. So that's why it's hard to think that bloggers are um, out of politics. They are in politics. Thank you very much, Ina. I find that really interesting. And I want to address the same issue uh, with Viktor Berezenko, founder of the Institute of Cognitive Modeling, also in Ukraine. Viktor, you've heard Ina's take on this issue. From, from your perspective, what do you see as the role of influencers uh, in in political processes? Uh, first of all, thank you, Magnus. Thank you, Daria, and thank you, Ina. Uh, you know, uh, I'm confident that, uh, in the opinion, that the influencers do have a role to play in politics. Also, I totally agree with Ina, as they uh, have the ability to reach large audiences and shape public opinion by using their platforms to raise awareness and uh, mobilize their followers on different social political is issues. Moreover, they can increase engagement and promote positive social change or non-positive social change, depends from the situation. And uh, we all know the way uh, to get the support of the electorate for a particular party, like to attract the opinion of the influencers, ask them to become uh, the face of the election campaign, or apply to the electoral list or become the nominal leaders of the party or something like that. And there are many cases and uh, they are various, both positive and negative. Nowadays, the role of influencers is relevant uh, in a slightly different context. And uh, like uh, I mentioned uh, in, in a lot when uh, commenting on the topics of Russian disinformation in the public sphere. And today it's more, more important than ever to remember about the impact uh, of words and actions. Moreover, I want to add that, uh, you know, bloggers now, uh, like, for example, in Ukraine, uh, we have, uh, after the war started, full-scale invasion, uh, people are receiving news about social political situation. 66% uh, of people they are receiving uh, from social media. And the national TV uh, became on the uh, second place with the 55%. So it's very important. And uh, blogging uh, now is not like separated profession because uh, we have uh, military guys uh, who are bloggers, singers who are bloggers, like uh, a lot of volunteers, they are bloggers. So blogging is, is a part of public activity of uh, any, any, any person. And uh, it's why I'm talking about Telegram, like for example, because a lot of bloggers, they are not using only just TikTok or Instagram or Facebook. They are using, uh, their personal telegram channels and for example in ukraine now uh, we have like the level of trust and, and it's extremely high to the uh, telegram channels and uh like oh, and even uh, 76 percent of telegram channels of ukraine are anonymous so it's just only uh, like 23 24 percent is uh, we know the who is uh, the owner and we know their names and what is the organization or, or, or private person so uh it's very important and uh, you know like we don't need to dig deeply into some psychological aspects or something else we just need to have a look on the numbers on the statistics and uh among the information uh we distribute through our channels like uh telegram uh, instagram uh, Viber, anything. Uh, I just want to mention that bloggers can also spread uh, disinformation, not intentional, 
not because they are some from you know from evil party or something like that because they are not aware about that they uh, you know they receive some kind of information emotionally and they just retranslate it and they repost it and uh, they are audience that could be more than audience of mainstream media yeah they they receiving this information and believing in it and other stuff so this is very important now now the role of bloggers is and influencers is extremely important in the in uh, nowadays politics so this is my opinion thank you thank you very much victor and i definitely want to get back to the issue of potential cons of their involvement in a second i want to first move over to uh, denisa halova strategic communications expert at charles university and czech republic denisa having heard what the text about by Daria and, and then Ina and Victor. From your perspective, <clears throat> what do you see as the potential role of social media influencers uh, in democratic resilience, if if any? So as um, most of the people have already mentioned, especially Daria, so the role of the influencer is uh, immense, but uh, their role in democracy can be either for good or for bad because the influencers can be either spreading democratic messages or they can be also a tool of propaganda spreading the messages that can influence the society for not very good aspects, basically. What we are now experiencing is a crisis of the traditional journalism where, um, as you mentioned, like all the news should be checked should be you know a proof if it's really right or wrong it takes some time you have a lot of editorial steps and that is sometimes not possible also the journalist uh, the journalistic standards are somehow deteriorating they are somehow like falling down in many countries the journalists are less paid and their content is like not so interesting anymore so people, especially we can see it uh, from many researchers, I can name the uh, Oxford Reuters research especially, we can see that the general public is switching off from the traditional news outlets, such as newspapers, media, television, to uh, the like in more interesting uh, content which is provided by the influencers. So sometimes the influencers also, even if they do entertainment, even if they're cooking or lifestyle bugglers, they provide the political context or political news to their followers, to their audience. However, we must bear in mind, this is not a journalistic content. This is an opinion. And this opinion can be shaped. I'm speaking from Central and Eastern Europe, and we have been under a long-term pressure, uh, especially uh, from Russia, to somehow diminish uh, the notion that there is one reality. So everything has become just a battle of opinions. Nothing is true. There is no one reality. Everything can be faked. So this is important to bear in mind that to have like a fostering democracy, we need freedom of speech, we need high journalistic standards, and we need real news, we need real media. Then we can build our own political opinion, and then after that we can choose the influencers that we like. But the influencers cannot somehow be a different kind of journalist. Thank you very much for that, Denisa. And Victor, I want to bounce back to you. Denisa mentioned potential good and bad uh, aspects of the involvement of influencers. You just mentioned in your previous answer the, the risk of influencers spreading disinformation, even if unintentionally. Um, so what do you see as the pros and cons for society of influencers being involved in politics? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, as in any other processes, we cannot say that any external influence in, is only positive. You know, uh, the same relates to the influencer engagement. So, uh, first of all, I want to share with you example. Like uh, we know, the Russian propagandist Salavyov, he has in his uh, Telegram uh, 
channel uh, more than 1 million subscribers. So is he a blogger? Yes, he's a blogger, but he's using his audience, he's using his tool to spread in Russian propaganda, disinformation and everything. So uh, we have a lot of examples uh, how bloggers are using their uh, popularity, their audience to spread truth, uh, to counter disinformation and uh, all that stuff. So uh, it's like uh, on the one hand, uh, we can say that the involvement of influencers helps raising the awareness or engagement regarding important issues and drawing attention to them. On the other, uh, we have a lot of examples uh, yeah, where we can really consider uh, partly as our merit is the Ukrainian ratification of Istanbul Convention Against Domestic Violence in 2022. Like for a year and a half before, we have launched a national campaign against domestic violence uh, with the with the famous face uh, Ukrainian blogger, which became a well-known public figure, and uh, a number of other uh, stars joined this campaign, and uh, people have started talking about the problem more loudly, and this is important. So, uh, like we can talk about the fact that influencers can be valuable for forming public opinion on other important issues, and uh, is this politics? I believe. Yes, th this was the positive example, you know, like uh, how it worked. So, uh, but there is still uh, a threat of spreading misinformation. Uh, as uh, was mentioned before, some influencers may spread misinformation in inaccurate uh, in, uh, information about politi political issues. So it can lead to confusion or a lack of understanding among their followers. So. It's everything, you know, two, two sides of this medal. Thank you very much, Victor. And let's turn this issue over to a person who works as an influencer, Ina. Um, basically, I want to ask you the same question as for Victor, but in your case, given your personal involvement of this, what, what do you see as the pros and cons uh, for society in particular? of influencers being involved in the democratic uh, resilience? Well, I will start from a uh, positive side, from uh, pros. First of all, readers, subscribers, they definitely trust the bloggers they read. That's why they join fundraisers, they join auctions, they trust information where to go, what to do, what to avoid, and so on. And even they ask and uh, believe their forecasts of uh, military actions. People in Ukraine do not wait when Zelensky says something. They need their favorite blogger to say this, when the war will end and when they will come back home and so on, so on. Uh, secondly, bloggers provide information promptly and without censorship. Bloggers share their feelings, their emotions, and people need these emotions to feel them in touch with the process. Because uh, it, when we are talking about mass media, it's uh, short news uh, and that's all. Blogger gives uh, his own opinion. Blogger, blogger gives his emotion. Blogger gives his soul in this news. And that's why the subscribers feel that uh, he understands what blogger talking about. Uh, the next one, and I think that's the most important for bloggers. Bloggers can both make someone an idol or destroy a person's career. We here in Ukraine have cases when public uh, authorities, uh, public uh, uh, people who have uh, authority in uh, Ukraine, uh, when public pressure forced someone to resign from this public position, this public work. And it means that blogger helped to develop the direct democracy. In uh, On the uh, one hand, it's okay, it's fine, because really people in short uh, term Say, uh, do they want to see this um, man or woman on this position or they don't? But I think that uh, we should uh, work more on this side. When bloggers push and press people, people position, when we are talking about public authorities. Uh, if uh, to go to cons, negative uh, sides, 
I think that the most problematic, uh, problematic is that bloggers do not have analytic skills to verify information. They mostly do not how distinguish a primary source from a high quality fake and thereby they help to spread the information very quickly. And bloggers add their emotional, as I said before, they add color to the news. And when we are talking about fake news, it's a really, really bad idea because they add the certain meaning of words. And if it is fake, it becomes easier to emotionally break society. And that's why we are also need to make some, um, I don't know, maybe journalistic standards and ethics for bloggers who spread the information. I also have few examples uh, in, because I'm bloggers, uh, as we said, mama bloggers, because I have kids and my auditory, my subscribers are mamas with kids. Uh, we had uh, in the first months of war uh, a lot of news about uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of kids whose parents died uh, and they were taken from the war zone. And uh, that it's really, there are no such cases in reality. And uh, everyone had uh, read about them, you know, because children are the most precious thing we have. And we are now we are fighting for the future of our children. And therefore, the thoughts that hundreds of thousands of children have lost their families are morally killing. Uh, people lose uh, their fate in future. People start to panic and bloggers help people to start the panic because they spread this fake information. Another aspect, uh, when bloggers start to spread the information, for example, that Ukrainian authorities do not evacuate the population uh, and do not create the green humanitarian corridors. And this causes uh, despair and the sense of helplessness uh, uh, for all of Ukrainians. Uh, none of bloggers understand what actions should be taken to evacuate and how to negotiate with the enemies who violate all the laws of war. And uh, the same one uh, example, how bloggers spread the information that the uh, authorities, the government want to surrender Mariupol or another city and they silent about the prisoners of war. We need to understand that these are military operations and detailed disclosure of these operations can corrupt them. And uh, again, it, uh, this information adds feelings that no one will save us. And bloggers spread these feelings and this information. Now, nowadays, uh, influencers have already developed their certain information ethics. Uh, bloggers already understand what the information is and how to present it. Uh, bloggers try to work uh, closely with military administrations to stop spreading fakes. But we have these uh, examples in the last year. Thank you very much, uh, Ina. <clears throat> Denisa, let's let's move forward now from the issue of whether um, influencers should be involved in politics to what risks do they face if they do. So from your perspective, even when influencers do get involved in political discussions, what are the main risks that they face in doing so? Well, evidently, as, as Ina has said previously, the influencers, they have, they put their soul uh, in what, in their content. So they are there for themselves. Nobody can replace them and it is their reputation. And the, it, it takes time to build a reputation, which is easily lost. If there is some kind of fake news or anything like that, so uh, it can be, it can be uh, easily lost. So um, it is it, it is hard uh, to keep the reputation going for the influencers. I wanted to say also that we must acknowledge that half of the world is living in the conditions where they have no free speech and they can be punished for what they say. If you compare the situation in Ukraine and in Russia, it it is so much different. In Russia, you can be in the jail, you can be put in the jail for what you say. So the risk of saying your own opinion is actually very high. And it is like, it's like amazing that Ukraine has still kept this level of freedom. 
However, we must acknowledge that the vast majority of other countries is really like, uh, according to the Economist Democracy Index, it's more than half of the world, which is living in the conditions which we cannot call full democracy. And there the limit of the free speech is somehow uh, is problematic. So everything is now digitally recorded. You can track back your political opinions years back. And the people, again, they, they are there for themselves. And, you know, you, you, you never know how the conditions will change or you have to be really very self-aware and very, like, um, um, strong to say your opinions uh, if it can affect you badly or if you go, if you can go to jail for your opinions. Thank you, Denisa. And you know, let's get back to you on that issue. So, as a practical example, uh, example, what what do you do uh, with followers who do not agree uh, with your opinions? Well, I understand that people here in Ukraine they already know what is happening here, and uh, my task is to convey the truth uh, to those who have a limited source of information. I was born in Donetsk. It's now temporarily occupied territory for the last nine years. And I have a lot of uh, classmates and neighbors who still live there. And they do not have the information from Ukraine and from all over the world except Russia. They live under Russian propaganda. But I know that they break the law to read some Instagram news at uh, my page or on the pages of uh, our friends as well. So because uh, they want to know more and uh, therefore they want to read us, Ukrainian bloggers. But human nature is such that we run away from information that directly puts responsibility on us. And um, for example, in the uh, first weeks of war, all of bloggers, singers and actors, they recorded videos uh, for their colleagues from Russia and asked them to stop war, to do something to stop this. Uh, such videos were really emotional because everyone recorded them from either bomb shelters uh, on the sounds of explosions or from evacuations because their own homes were in war zone. And uh, that's why we were not uh, talking politely or gently. We called the spade a spade. And as a result, Russian people start to unsubscribe During the first months of war, for example, I have lost 30,000 of subscribers because these subscribers were either from Russia or from temporary occupied territory under Russian propaganda. But I know that some of them still read me. And that's why I try to publish information cautiously. No accusation, no threats, uh, no wishes to feel uh, everything on themselves, for example. Um, I try to take some fake and uh, show why it's not true. Or I simply and without emotions show the truth about events in Ukraine. And uh, I always try to show it from the first persons who actually experience it, because uh, they know about all of these cases in Bucha and in Irpin, and they believe that this is fake and like a theater. But uh, when we are talking with the person who felt it on himself and he uh, uh, tell his own story, story of his family, I think that someone may believe it, may hear him, not the propaganda. And I think that it will give Russians some doubt that their television uh, isn't showing all the truth. Um, I need to say that we do not communicate with such people. Uh, they just read me or hear me, and that's all. We tried to communicate on the first months of war, but uh, all of the Russians were really rude. They wished us death and so on. 
I cannot change the opinion of such people, really. They are under propaganda really hard. And uh, I try to fight for those who have critical thinking, uh, who are threatened by the Russian authority, for example. And I think that not only my, our bloggers task is to cause, is not to cause uh, disgust, for example, towards me or towards another blogger and not to cause desire to defend themselves. Uh, because information uh, shouldn't push on people, because uh, then people just will try to find the justification for all the actions of Russia, because they do not want to take responsibility and to say, yes, I'm also guilty, and all of the people here are guilty uh, in all of the in all of the war process in Ukraine. So that's why we need to make it uh, easier, gently, more gently, more polite. We need to show only the facts without any emotions and without talking about uh, the concrete person. We need just to show the reality and give the space for those people uh, to make their own opinion about this situation. If they have critical thinking, they will find out that uh, not uh, the world isn't uh, the same as our television, I mean Russian television says. I think that there are a lot of in other opinions and I want to hear them. And I, as I'm talking, as for me, I want to be this one of these opinions and all of the bloggers should be this opinion too. Because we try to do it uh, Heart. We try to do it emotional. We try to say you're guilty, you're killing my friends, uh, uh, my close people and so on. And so uh, we just got uh, one result, unsubscribes and that's all. And all of these people, they do not hear us who unsubscribed our accounts. They, uh, they live in their own world under Russian propaganda where they believe that everything that uh, American, European, Ukrainian mass media shows uh, is just uh, it's just a TV show. But I believe that there are a lot of people who have critical thinking and we need to talk to them. Thank you very much, uh, Ina. Uh, Victor, a question for you. And we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we appreciate uh, concise answers. We've heard, including from your institute, that the Russian government is setting up um, fake social media accounts for propaganda purposes. So effectively, we are talking about the involvement in politics of influencers who do not exist. So a real name, a real picture, but the content is uh, otherwise generated. Can you talk a little bit more about, about this issue? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, it's true. Uh, as you may know, armed forces of Ukraine have the trust uh, in Ukrainian society more than 96% of the Ukrainians. So, uh, and uh, it should be understood that Russia is taking more and more new ways to manipulate the Ukrainians and also Europeans. And among the latest uh, cases is the manipulation of trust in the armed force uh, of Ukraine and the creation of fake accounts of the Ukrainian military. And uh, like the account of the Ukrainian warrior was duplicated. Uh, all the original videos were used and published with only like, seems like small difference, but a big difference, a text edition. You know, and uh, as usual, they are using accounts of uh, not so popular uh, warriors uh, because, uh, the, uh, you know, if they will use the accounts of uh, stars or, or like bloggers with uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, so it will be very fast, uh, you know, will close. But uh they are using uh, the fakes account uh, that are much easier to notice uh, you know and uh, the situation is not so simple so uh, russian propaganda is trying to spread signals also through the fake accounts uh, and they're trying to divide the society and they're trying to sow the seeds of doubt and anti-ukrainian narratives and this is what they are continuing doing but all we remember like um, the cases of the meta company, like they discovered uh, hundreds of uh, fake accounts, also of well, like fake well known media that uh, were spreading the Russian propaganda on the social networks. 
So this is the tough work. It's not so easy as it seems uh, for the first sight, you know, and you need to be careful. You need to check every single byte of information that you're receiving. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, and let's move now to positive steps, to solutions, to what can be done to help to improve the situation uh, against all the challenges that we've been addressing so far. And I'm asking Ina, first of all, um, as an influencer, what support would you benefit from in your engagement to support democratic resilience? Well, I think that uh, if the authorities all over the world begin to work closely with bloggers, if they will explain how to distinguish truth from fakes, if they will teach, uh, for example, bloggers journalistic standards and ethics, then bloggers can become a real mass media that delivers information quickly and directly to the heads of target audience. And governments all over the world should recognize the influence of bloggers on society and to start to work with uh, bloggers together. Uh, in Ukraine, Ukrainian authorities are already understood this and uh, this will definitely have a positive impact of, uh, on the development of Ukraine. Uh, military administrations, uh, governments, administrations, so on, they work with bloggers together to spread real information that will have a positive uh, uh, solution in future. And I think that uh, it's not only in Ukraine should be this way. All over the world, uh, authorities uh, should uh, um, say that bloggers are real have power and force and that's why they need to work together but authorities and government should give some rules for bloggers to spread information and, and i think that uh, the same things as for journalists uh, will be really good such as ethics standards and so on so on maybe some courses or education i don't know uh, um, all of the countries should prepare their own rules for bloggers uh, to work uh, freely and directly. Thank you very much, uh, Ina. And Denisa, you've heard the points that Ina just stressed. Uh, from your perspective, what support do you think generally uh, is valuable in supporting influencers in this role? Well, definitely, as Ina said, the governments should acknowledge that the influencers do have influence on their publics uh, and try to uh, somehow uh, count on them as well. Uh, from my point of view, uh, the perspective uh, as, uh, is not easy, actually. Uh, to promote democracy, we need people to value it. We need to promote basic rights, such as you know, human rights, freedom of the speech, freedom of the press. And we have to promote, actually, critical thinking, because... What Ana said previously as well, uh, the, she believes in the people that they have their own critical thinking and they will make up their own opinion. This is not automatic. You have to be somehow educated to develop critical thinking. And in many countries, this is not the top priority to develop critical thinking in their own publics. It is quite easy uh, to manipulate people uh, through various forms of technology. Um, it can be fake accounts, what Victor talked about a lot. It, it can be fake identities. It, it can be good old school propaganda. What we see now are the same propaganda techniques we have seen in the First World War, just in a new kind of fashion. It's just the digital technology makes it everything more up to date and more fashionable, but the principles of propaganda are the same. So we should educate the people about what propaganda is, how it serves, and what is totality, what it means to be living in a totalitarian regime, how your life is constrained, and actually that you can also live differently. Thank you very much, Denisa. And in the interest of time, I'll direct the last question to Daria Asri of North uh, at IFES. Um, Daria, what is IFES then doing to support the freedom of speech and democratic resilience in Europe, the type of issues we've been talking about for the last hour? 
So uh, at IFES, uh, we seek to build the capacity of electoral stakeholders to respond to both old and new challenges to democracy and electoral integrity. Uh, we very much recognize the role and the power of social media in advancing democratic resilience. So we seek to help our electoral stakeholders wield uh, this power for good, for building public trust in democratic institutions and countering disinformation and propaganda. Uh, we also recognize that, influ that EMBs, election management bodies, like influencers, also have a brand to protect. So how well this brand is protected actually has a profound impact uh, on the credibility of the electoral process. Um, for this, we've developed a range of tools uh, for election management bodies to be better prepared in responding to disinformation, uh, having a productive social media presence so that they can meet people where they are and uh, communicate effectively with the electorate. Uh, we've conducted a range of social media trainings and also developed a crisis comms and combating disinformation playbook. And also, um, last point, similarly to what Denisa and Ina talked about, um, we believe that civic education and media literacy are one of the most important tools to countering disinformation and propaganda. So uh, we have civic education university courses that prepare young people to be mindful consumers of information in the digital age, to build their critical thinking skills um, and inspire them to be active leaders uh, with democratic values in their communities. Um, and then we also strive to look at these issues through the gender lens. So looking at how issues such as gender disinformation also negatively impact women's rights and access um, in the political and democratic space. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you to all our panelists. We'll now open for questions. If you have any questions, just use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And while you're typing away, I'll read out some questions that have come in so far. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is for Victor um, in relation to the Institute for Cognitive Modeling. So can you explain a bit how the Institute is supporting the engagement on influences uh, in democratic resilience in, in the Ukrainian context? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, over the past year, our team had launched a number of projects aimed uh, in, uh, at overcoming the consequences of the destructive influence of Russian disinformation. And uh, since the very first days of the Russian invasion, uh, we have united more than 140 Ukrainian stars and celebrities and opinion leaders around our informational channels in Telegram and Viber. Like uh, directly, we, we created a group and we add uh, all of the celebrities that we could find and we started to work with them, like uh, uh, share with them messages. Uh, at the very first day, it, it, it was like uh, every se single second, some new informational signal. So we tried to, you know, to manage that signals, like this is the information, this is fake, this is true. We tried to, uh, you know, to check, fact check all everything. And uh, we called uh, this group Star Battalion and uh, like they have become translators of national messages to the internal and external audiences. So they had supported the resilience of the Ukrainians uh, and uh, we saw the results. It was the really, really, really great uh, experience. And we keep doing uh, something like that. And now we are thinking about what Ina uh, had been told about, like uh, to create some literacy uh, courses for uh, bloggers, celebrities and everything. So we are working on it all the time. Thank you very much, Victor, for that. We also received a question, as for all of our panelists, um, and it's maybe not the easiest one. I'm, I'll read out. <clears throat> How can we tell influencers who are trying to support democratic resilience apart from those who are trying to undermine democracy? Who would like to go first? Denisa? I'll pick that one. That's a tough one. That's a tough question. Uh, for me, it is historical knowledge. Because we have seen recently, there is a large group of people who are just demonstrating for peace. Now, if you want peace, what's, what's bad 
with peace. There's nothing wrong with it. Everybody wants peace, of course. However, um, those demonstrations, especially in the Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Germany, are not for peace. Uh, they, in fact, want to just continue uh, and prolong the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And they are, in fact, against the peace. So me coming from a com post-communist background, I still remember when I was a child, uh, on every tra political transparent in every school, there was, we're fighting for peace. And the contradiction between the fight and the peace was something I could not comprehend as a kid. So nowadays, when I see we're fighting for, for peace, again, it strikes my mind and I see, oh, that's the propaganda again. So for me, it's historical knowledge because the history repeats again and again, sadly. Thank you very much, Denisa. Any of our other panelists who would like to talk to this issue? Then I'll raise another question <clears throat> that has come in um, from Liberia in this case. What role can international partners or communities play to help to support uh, discouraging the spread of misinformation, disinformation by influencers and bloggers in, in any society? Victor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do believe that uh, Ina uh, has a great idea, like about this, uh, you know, the education of bloggers and influencers of uh, awareness, you know, to fact checking and uh, uh, like how to, you know, how to see this this information that is hiding between the headlines, you know uh this is very important because sometimes bloggers they are you know they are followers addicted likes addicted so sometimes this pursuit for these likes and followers uh, is very emotional you know and uh you don't have any time to for fact checking for double check or for something you just repost or put some opinion but we need to work uh, with the with the awareness, with the values, with everything, and it's really hard now. Maybe we could launch faster something like that program uh, with the help of of the partners, of international partners, you know, the, the, than by ourselves. So I do believe that this is the simple, the simple way how we can move forward, and of course uh publish uh, any kind of uh, uh books any kind of uh, frequently asked asked questions and everything and everything to spread it uh, in the bloggers communities so i i believe that that could be you know, very effective thank you very much victor uh, uh daria yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think there's two sides to it. So to reiterate the importance of broader media literacy, especially among young people and making sure that, you know, the people who are following influencers and all this content across different areas, uh, that they have, you know, critical thinking skills and awareness of the information that they are consuming. And then likewise, you know, recognizing, as we've been talking about, the immense power and potential of influencers, uh, which I think will continue to evolve and rise um, as people who are, can be mood makers, uh, agenda setters, um, and activists in their own right, empowering them with the right tools, raising their awareness um, to also practice uh, certain forms of information hygiene um, as a, you know, basic standard and principle um and and just i think also kind of continuing to look at the different uh opportunities for uh creatively reaching people um with this evolution of the role of social media so international organizations um also organizations like victors um looking at how can you reach young people for example in an effective and engaging way so if you partner with influencers uh, for good uh, you are able to create content that actually more effectively reaches 
you know, the average person um, in many of these countries and oftentimes and, you know, uh, young people feel very isolated in uh, some of these authoritarian regimes. So uh, creating messages and working with influencers um, to reach more people could be um, a really valuable and powerful tool. Thank you very much, Daria. Um... Ina, please. Yeah, yes, I also want to add, uh, uh, as Victor said, it's like a practical idea uh, what to do to make some courses, some education for bloggers. But I think that partners can also help by giving their own opinion. Uh, for example, we are now in Ukraine fighting for democracy, but democracy exists not only in Ukraine, it's all over the world. And what is it, this democracy? What do you think? Uh, and um, all the bloggers here in Ukraine and in uh, USA, in Europe, all over the world, they need to exchange their own opinions. Uh, how do they influence on people? Uh, what the main ideas uh, in, those, in their blogs and so on? Uh, we need to make... Um, uh, all over the world, uh, um, ideas for bloggers, like standards, blogger standards. And to make them, we need to communicate with each other. Maybe some forums, panels, webinars, or so on, where we can meet each other. Here in Ukraine, we bloggers uh, prepare maybe once a week uh, uh, some... Um, I don't know, branches for bloggers, only for bloggers, where we can uh, share our ideas, uh, um, our opinions and so on, because blogger is a profession. Uh, when I want to be a medical, I need to uh, educate for eight years. When I want to be a lawyer, I need to uh, go to university for six years. When I want to be a blogger, I just need to uh, download Instagram, TikTok or so on. I do not uh, need any education. Maybe course is a good idea, but the uh, good idea also to change opinions with other bloggers all over the world. And I think that uh, our partners can um, operate this system. Thank you very much, Ina. And thank you uh, to all everyone involved. We've come to the end of our time together. I want to thank uh, our panelists. I want to thank you for participating in the discussion. I again want to thank USAID for supporting this event and my IFAS colleagues for preparing it. The next installment in this discussion series will come the end of April. I hope to see you all in that discussion and until then, stay safe.